Welcome to the Texas Lieutenant Governor Debate 2014. I'm Ross Ramsey with the Texas Tribune and I will be tonight's moderator. This is the only scheduled debate between the two major party candidates for Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Democrat Leticia Van de Pute, a state senator from San Antonio, and Republican Dan Patrick, a state senator from Houston. Ms. Van de Pute, a pharmacist, was elected to the Texas House in 1990 and has served in the state Senate since 1999. She chairs the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs and Military Installations. She and her husband have six children and six grandchildren. Mr. Patrick, a radio talk show host and writer, took his seat in the Texas Senate in 2007. He is currently chairman of the Senate Committee on Education. Mr. Patrick and his wife have two children and one grandchild. Let me go quickly through the rules the candidates have agreed upon. They flipped a coin to determine the order in which they open and close. Each will have 90 seconds for an opening statement and 90 seconds for a closing statement. I will alternate my questions between the candidates. The first will get two minutes to respond, the second will get two minutes, and the first will then have a 30 second rebuttal. We are using lights to show everyone where they are on the clock. You can watch too. The colored bar on the bottom left hand corner of your screen will be green when the candidate's time starts. It goes yellow when they're down to 30 seconds and will be flashing yellow for the last 10 seconds of their time. When the bar turns red, their time is up and they have each agreed to stop there. The debate is being produced jointly by KLRU-TV, Austin PBS, and the Texas Tribune. Other production partners include Univision Austin and the Texas Association of Broadcasters. Let's get started. Uh, Senator Van Depute won the coin toss. You may begin. Thank you, Ross. Good evening. I am so thankful to be able to visit with you tonight. My name is Leticia Van de Pute, and for six generations, our family, the San Miguels, have proudly called Texas home. I've been a pharmacist for over 30 years and a proven effective legislator for over 20 years. I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother and I'm a Texan first. I bring my experience as a pharmacist and a small business owner to this race and I have a plan, a prescription for our Texas. From ending high stakes testing on our students to making sure that each qualified high school graduate has the opportunity to continue their learning. My prescription, my plan, focuses on infrastructure of roads, highways, and bridges, and water for our farmers and our ranchers and our businesses so that we can continue to grow and create high paying jobs. My prescription honors our veterans and their families, making sure that they have the resources that they deserve, they need, and have earned. I wanna make sure that we're prepared for the next generation, and that's why I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. I offer sound solutions, not just sound bites. We need responsible decision makers, not reckless action. And I am so thankful to be with you tonight. I wanna make sure that Texans are ready for the next generation. Muchisimas gracias. I look forward to visiting with you tonight. Senator Patrick. By the way, we have three grandchildren now, two born during the campaign, so we'll update Sorry, that. I missed a point there. That's all right. Hi, everyone, I'm Dan Patrick. You know, in the race for lieutenant governor, there's never been such a clear difference between two candidates. Both of us have been in the Senate for a long time. We have long voting records. I'm rated as one of the most conservative, and my opponent is rated as one of the most liberal. Now, I know her well, and I like her. We've sat next to each other on the Senate floor for eight years. But she's out of step with the vast majority of Texans on almost every issue. She voted for a tax on wages. That's an income tax. She opposed cutting property taxes and business taxes. She voted against tort reform that has brought 30,000 doctors here to Texas in the last 10 years. She wants to expand Obamacare. She's pro-choice, she's pro-amnesty, and she was against sending the National Guard to secure our border. My record is also clear. I'm pro-life, I'm pro-business. In fact, virtually every business organization in the state of Texas has endorsed our campaign based on my pro-job creation record. When it comes to taxes, I'm going to cut your property taxes. It's time that Texas homeowners had real property tax relief, and I'll get that done. And there'll be one other top priority that I have that my opponent does not. I will secure the border. You know, for the last decade, Texas has led the nation in job growth under conservative Republican leadership. We have the 12th largest economy in the world. Now is not the time to change directions and go in a liberal path that would turn Texas to California. My name's Dan Patrick. I will secure the border. I'll protect life. I'll create educational and opportunities and economic opportunities for every Texan. I look forward to our discussion tonight. Thanks for watching. 
the state auditor, the first question is for you, Senator, the state auditor who reports to the legislature said last week that the state had given $170 million to companies for economic development without requiring written applications and had in several cases not watched to make sure that the companies were doing what they had promised in return for the state's money. Should we continue to operate these incentive funds and if so, with what kind of oversight? Also, it took a decade for lawmakers to actually look into this. Where were you guys? Thank you very much. I was appalled to learn that the governor had instilled a process for our Texas Enterprise Fund that had no accountability. You see, when it comes to government programs and to incentive programs, those economic tools, it shouldn't be about who you know, it should be about what you know. This has been very distressing. And I know that we need to compete globally to make sure that we've got the jobs for the future. This ought to be stopped immediately until a full audit can be made. Transparency decisions are important, and Texans deserve that. Texans know that transparency is important, and that's why I don't understand why my opponent, Dan Patrick, has refused to disclose his taxes. Everyone else in this race, all of the opponents that you had disclosed their taxes, as of I. So I ask you tonight, Dan, Will you disclose your taxes as everyone else? And if not, Texans can rightly ask the question, Dan, what are you hiding? Senator. Let's talk about the, uh, first of all, the Enterprise Fund. Uh, I've taken the position that I think we should end it. Uh, I'll leave that final decision to the next governor and to the legislature. Uh, but I took that position before this latest audit report. It's something we have to thoroughly look at. When it comes to attracting businesses to Texas, the best thing we can do is eliminate the business tax. And the best thing we can do is lower property taxes so employees of companies who move to Texas can live in their home with a low tax rate. And even when they retire and they pay it off, they don't have to rent it from the state. The real attraction of Texas is our economic opportunity, which is second to none but we can take it to the next level. The business tax, as Lieutenant Governor, I will strive to end that tax or greatly reform it, but we should end the tax. That will be the magnet to draw businesses to Texas, not the Enterprise Fund or the Emerging Technology Fund. And again, lowering property taxes, we already have great home values compared to other states around the country, but we need to lower that tax rate. In terms of my opponent's last comment, you may not know this, but uh, we file a financial disclosure form every year she does, and I do. Every legislator does. I think my form last year was 164 pages. Uh, about, I think my tax return was eight. Um, the 164 pages list every stock I own, every bond I own, every mutual fund I own, every business I'm in, everything about me you'd ever want to know. Dr. Rabat. Thank you. In this case, when we talk about jobs and the vibrancy of the Texas economy, no one beats us. But again, Dan is the only Republican that I know that wants to increase your sales taxes. He calls it a tax swap, but when all actuality, it's just tooth fairy tax policy. Who would want to raise taxes on our businesses? And he wants to raise your taxes, but he won't release his. Senator Patrick, this question is for yes, you. Sir. A student has lived in Texas for three years, got a degree from a Texas high school, and has applied for citizenship papers. Should he or she continue to be eligible for in-state tuition rates at Texas schools? Should he or she be deported? Well, my opponent authored the law uh, to give in-state tuition to students who are here illegally. And I surely empathize with the situation that students who are brought here uh, by others uh, and who have done a great job to graduate from high school that they would want in-state tuition. And I think sometimes the public gets confused. We're not saying they can't go to college or they can't go to a community college or a four-year college. But it's a question of fairness, Ross. Uh, I asked this question when I debated the mayor of San Antonio this spring. If there was only one seat left at a university and two students had the equal GPA, equal SAT, uh, ACT scores, and the choice was between an American student, a Mexican-American student, an African-American student, anyone, and someone who was not a legal citizen of our country, who would get the seat? He wouldn't answer the question. I don't know how my opponent would answer it, but it's just a question of fairness. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that in the, in the last comment, my uh, opponent said about raising taxes. She has voted against every tax cut for property taxes 
that I can find in the last 10 years. She's voted against business tax cuts. She actually wants an income tax because she voted on wage taxes. And my idea, folks, is simply this. We put too much emphasis on the backs of homeowners and property taxes. So what I said was, we will lower your property taxes. And then, because I will never support an income tax, even though my opponent last week said, well, she might consider it if the economy was weak. I'll never consider an income tax, but we should have everyone sharing in the cost for our schools, our cities, and our counties. And it's not a tax swap. What it is is lowering your property taxes, and we'll talk hopefully more about that later. And it's also, if we add it, a penny or two pennies to the sales tax, we can generate enough money to lower your property taxes every more, e even more. We have about four and a half million homeowners in Texas, and they're carrying the burden of the entire state on their back. And as lieutenant governor, I'm going to give you real property tax relief. I'm not going to raise your taxes. I'm going to lower your taxes. My opponent is the one who wants to raise every tax she can find. Senator Van Pute. The Texas Dream Act was authored and signed into law by Governor Rick Perry in 2001. It's been working well, and I was proud to be its author in the Senate. I worked with the Texas Association of Business and my Republican colleagues to form a plan to make sure that children who were bought here through no fault of their own would have the opportunity to pay the same intuition as the people that they graduated from high school with. You see, Dan Patrick hasn't read the bill. This is not about admissions. This is about what you pay in tuition at the registrar's office. And this, we know, is important for the workforce. Other Republican candidates that are running statewide don't agree with you, Senator Patrick. They know that the hardworking students who have earned the chance to pay the same and to probably one day they want to serve in our military they should be given that chance. That's why I've called for the Texas Promise Plan because it's about that workforce. That Texas Promise Plan offers every single high school graduate that's qualified two years of community college or that technical program. We know that the jobs of the future are gonna require a post high school something, whether it's a technical program, a certification, a licensure, an associate's degree, or a college degree. We know that those are the jobs. All of our students should have that opportunity. We could take a one-time withdrawal from our rainy day fund, have the voters vote on it, and a one-time investment could change a generation to continue a workforce that's young, that's diverse, that's plentiful, and that's well-educated. That's the Texas way. Senator Patrick. I have read the bill, uh, Leticia, and my point was that the University of Texas, where there are very few slots, it could come down to a student who is not a citizen and one who is. I will stand by the citizen to get that slot. Uh, in terms of the in-state tuition, it's just a question of fairness again. And it's one of those magnets that's created the situation we have in Texas that she has voted for every one. She also voted after the in-state tuition. She voted to give illegal immigrants in this country free health care. Not emergency health care, but total free health care. Uh, that was about seven years ago, and that bill didn't pass. The point is Senator. that we have to have a secure border, we have to protect our citizens who are here, and we have to have a sense of fairness in our public policy to everyone. Let me remind you both to mind the clock. Yes, sir. Senator Vandepute, the Texas-Mexico border has become the focal point of a national debate over immigration. Texas is spending hundreds of millions dispatching state police and Texas Guard troops to that area. Is that necessary? Is it sustainable? and will the federal government pay the state back for it? Thank you, Ross. The issue of immigration is one that has drawn so much emotion. We must secure the border. We need to make sure that our citizens are protected and we need to listen and respect those local leaders. People like Sheriff Lucio in Cameron County who have asked for extra help as Lieutenant Governor, I would make sure that our local law enforcement officers have the tools that they need and the personnel that they need to get the job done. You see, it's the local law enforcement officers that can arrest those that will want to come and sell your teenager's drug, those that enter into the vile crime of human trafficking. Those local leaders have asked for help, and as Lieutenant Governor, I would make sure that that occurs. But what doesn't help is when harsh rhetoric and the politics of fear damage a region, that they disrespect the people that live there. 
the McAllen Chamber of Commerce and those business leaders have asked Senator Patrick and those that would use that vile rhetoric to tone it down. It hurts their economy and hurts their ability to attract jobs. We sure do need to hold Washington, D.C. accountable, and I'm frustrated and mad just as other citizens are. But as Texans, we can do something, and that's to make sure that we've got the DPS there, that we've got our local law enforcement, and that we give those district attorneys extra help so they can prosecute those crimes. I know that pointing guns at children, which we saw this summer, is not the solution. Let's make sure that we secure the border, but that we do so in a manner that is tax efficient and that actually gets the job done. You know, I've uh, heard her talk about this uh, harsh rhetoric. Maybe you're talking about something like this, that the public health crisis could quickly be upon us if we don't face the reality that immigrants often carry invisible diseases. Is that what you're talking about? Um, that maybe tuberculosis, measles, and hepatitis are serious potential coming across the board. Is that what you're talking about is harsh? Because if you are, you should talk to Senator Juan Hinojosa because he's the Democrat from Corpus Christi in the Valley who wrote that editorial. Uh, my opponent, as I said, is out of step with Texans on a large number of issues, and securing the border is just one. Look, no country should have a de facto policy that says to come to America you have to drown in the river or die in the back of an 18-wheeler. We need Washington to act, and I blame both the Republicans and the Democrats in Washington, but until Texas secures the border, then Washington will never act with legal immigration reform. I've been very clear in my debate in San Antonio with Mayor Castro. Uh, I support a guest worker program when the border is secured. I don't, I don't support it all, and, and neither does anyone I know of deporting 10 million people out of this country. But we have to have a secure border against terrorists today, against the drug cartels today, and hardened criminals. It's a lot more than just people coming here working for the American dream. And they need to be able to come here in dignity and not live in the shadows. We need illegal, we need legal immigration reform to stop illegal immigration that's happening. And in terms of the statistics, folks, our DPS, they estimate we have 100,000 dangerous gang members in Texas here illegally. From 2008 to 2012, we arrested 143,000 criminals we later identified as being here illegally. We charged them with 447,000 crimes, including over 5,000 rapes and 2,000 murders. This is a serious issue, and ISIS threatens us today to come across our border. As Lieutenant Governor, this will be my top priority, and we'll also urge Washington to pass legal immigration reform so that people can come to America in dignity. And by the way, those sheriffs on the border, almost all of them Democrat, in the spring, they all endorsed me because they know I'll get the job done. Senator Vanderpeel. Thank you. In referring to harsh rhetoric, it wasn't what my colleague Juan Inahosa said. It's what you said, Senator Patrick. You accused these children of coming with diseases like leprosy. You've compared this to third world, and you've disrespected the people who live on that border. I voted for the budget that included over $130 million to DPS for their purposes of enforcing Border Patrol. Texans understand that you say one thing and you do another. My grandmother understood it. She would give us those pearls of wisdom and it would be those dichos. And that's what she said. It should be hechos, not dichos. So it's not what you say, Senator Patrick, it's what you do. And the fact of the matter is, you voted against the funding for our border security this past legislative session. Senator Patrick, I think yes, this one's yours. How should the state's current laws on abortion and end of life issues be changed, if at all? What do you think about the effects of last year's, last summer's legislation restricting abortions after 20 weeks and raising standards on facilities where those operations are performed? And by the way, one of the reasons I voted against the budget was because it didn't fund enough money for border security. Um, this is an issue, and again, taxes, securing the border, wanting to expand Obamacare, I do not. Tort reform, she voted against. We can go down a lot of issues where we disagree. Life is one. I carried the sonogram bill, as you know, Ross. It took me several sessions to pass it. It's estimated it will save 12 to 15,000 babies' lives this year. My opponent voted against the sonogram bill six different times. Last year in the filibuster, uh, I was sad to see my opponent cheering on the anarchist who took control of the Capitol that night. Uh, I was sad to see my opponent this year, one year after, one year after 
the filibuster. It's a Democrat convention. They actually held a party to celebrate killing a bill that would have saved the lives of five-month-old babies. Now, you can be pro-choice. Everyone has a right to their opinion. But to celebrate killing a bill that took the life of five-month-old babies in the womb? So when it comes to this issue, Ross, make no mistake, I'm pro-life, and my opponent has a clear record of being pro-choice and not standing for life. And there are so many people in this state, Dallas and Houston, the Valley, El Paso, good, strong conservatives who voted Democrat for many years who will not vote for a Democrat who takes the life of innocent lives in the womb. And my opponent has a clear record. That's what she stands for. That's what she celebrated. And that was a sad day for all of us on the Senate floor when we saw that happening. Senator Vandepute, how would you change current laws, if at all? Thank you very much. What we know is that the most important and personal decisions need to be made by women. They need to be made by the families. Pete and I are Catholic. We've had six children in nine years, and we've lived our faith. And what I know is a healthcare professional, and what I know is a mother and a grandmother, is that I want zero abortions. But the way you do that is not by making the services and the access almost non-existent. You do that by making it unnecessary in the first place. Unlike my opponent, I have fought for so much services so that women can get the family planning that they need, so that they can get contraception. You know, all of us banned the abortions after five weeks, after five months, after those 20 weeks. And I stood with that. But all I wanted was an exception, an exception that my opponent did not want and that's for rape and incest. He didn't even want an exception for rape and incest of a child. That's rape. Those decisions need to be made by the families. They need to be made by women. You need to trust women. And I guess my opponent doesn't. He doesn't trust women to make the decisions. He doesn't think it's a problem if rape kits go on tested on the shelf. He voted against the funding that would have tested these rape kits, the backlog. But I guess it's not a problem. He's also said for women that if you get paid less than a man for the same job, that that's not a problem either. So I can understand why he won't respect women and the decisions that they make, not even in the cases of rape and incest. Senator Patrick. Let's get back to the heart of this issue. We can negotiate and compromise on lots of issues but you either protect life or you don't. And when I hear Democrats talking about how conservative Republicans don't respect women, the one way you respect women is to protect little girls in the womb. Now, I understand there's some people have a difference of opinion on rape or incest, but that child is still born in the image of God and is still a living human being. My opponent is clear. She tries to use flowery language but she has stood against life ever since she's been in the legislature, and that's almost 24 years. Again, let me remind you about the clock. Senator Van de Pute, legislators have gradually lowered the state's share of funding for public schools, for higher education, and for roads. Local hospitals complain that low state aid forces them to shoulder costs for uncompensated care. As the state did those things, local property taxes increased, tuition went up, we maxed out our highway debt and created miles and miles of toll roads. How would you address this and should the state step up? Absolutely. The state should step up. We know that we are in a golden age of oil and gas. We've been blessed with wonderful natural resources. We're going to have over $8.4 billion in the rainy day fund. And that's even after the allocation of the water projects that Texans voted for last November and hopefully the measure that Texans will go to the polls for and vote for our highway funds this November. We know that our revenues are increasing. In fact, the Comptroller has just told us that we'll have $5 billion more than what we allocated when we go to the legislature in January 15. The fact of the matter is, Dan Patrick had a choice 
twice. First, he voted against our children, and that cost 11,000 teachers their jobs. It forced 8,000 class size waivers. And we know the effect on higher education. Voting against those universities required higher tuition. In 2013, many of my Republican friends, people that we work with every day, worked with us. And they came back because they realized that the price was too high and returned some of those funds to our public education and to higher education. My opponent, Dan Patrick, voted again against our students, again against those families and students who have the dream of higher education. As Lieutenant Governor, I would assemble the best minds, tap all of the senators, and work to make sure that we've got our infrastructure, water, roads, highways, that we do job one and that's to make sure that our public education system is funded correctly, that we value teachers, that we don't, again, force them to lose their jobs. We know that Texans understand that teachers spend hundreds of dollars each year on school supplies. The real question is, will we invest in the future? As Lieutenant Governor, I'd make sure that we focus on that investment. Senator Patrick. Is this on education or transportation? This is on education, transportation, well, hopefully you can give us a transportation because both are sure. worth uh, two minutes. Right. Um, folks, she knows better. Uh, I was chair of education. Uh, she served with me. In fact, I don't think she cast a no vote in education this entire session. She cast a few present not votings, but I think she was with us on the floor. Uh, she applauded what we did in terms of reforming education, reducing star tests from 15 to 5 and putting more focus on career. And I don't take the credit for that as chair. We worked as a team. And those bills passed, one of them passed 181 to nothing. Every Democrat and Republican voted to reform education. And I was proud to lead with Jimmy Don Acock, the chair of the House, on that, on that issue. My wife's been a longtime school teacher. She's retired now. And this idea that I voted ag against education funding, you know, she's right. Back in 09, when the downturn was on, and your 401k was down 30%, and so was the teacher retirement fund, people were afraid of losing their job. We had a choice. Conservative Republicans decided not to raise your taxes. And so we cut education by $4 billion in the formulas and about another billion, five total. Now let's put this in perspective, folks. Our budget is $100 billion. That's our state revenues. Education is $53 billion. 53% is education, about 30% is, is Medicaid, match and 10% is public safety. So 90% of our budget is public safety, Medicaid and education. We made a decision as Republicans we weren't going to cut back on public safety. We couldn't do much about Medicaid. So with a 23 billion dollar shortfall we had a choice and we cut the average school district between four and six percent and the world didn't end and our education system moved forward. And this session as a member of finance and chair of education as Tommy Williams, the chair of finance, has said publicly, she's using this for politics, I voted to restore almost all those dollars, uh, but I did not vote for the final budget when it came back changed from the House. Senator Van de Pute. Thank you. The facts are clear. When we're talking about education, we have choices. We can decide to cut or we can decide to invest. And I'm so thankful that Texans understand the importance of investment and education and that we're talking about education. Because Dan, you need a math lesson. The fact of the matter is 11,000 teachers lost their jobs, 8,000 class waivers. A judge has said that our system is inefficient, inequitable, and not working. As Lieutenant Governor, job one is public education. You two are running a lot of red lights. Um, <laughs> Senator Patrick, this one's yours. Replacing property taxes with sales taxes would nearly double sales taxes in Texas by some estimates. Would you support a shift in state taxes? And would you consider expanding sales taxes to things that are now exempt like real estate, transactions, food and medicine in order to lower property taxes? No on that issue. Um, and I just want to follow up. Look, folks, as chair of education, no one loves public education more than me. And I know my math. And I know when the state's short 23 billion, there's a choice between cutting about 4% to 5% in the education budget or raising your taxes when you're not even sure if you have a job, I'm gonna stand with you. And by the way, those 11,000 teachers, it's a lot of jobs. We have 332,000 teachers. 
And those 11,000 teachers were a lot who just retired. She kind of masked over that. And those 11,000 slots, for the most part, were replaced by, like, the math department head or various people. So your children weren't shorted. She's exaggerating the facts to try to make a point. So her response would have been, she would have raised your taxes in 2009 instead of cutting 4 to 5% out of education. On property taxes, here's the deal. Your property taxes are too high because of appraisal creep. So kind of think of your property taxes as a seesaw. What I want to do as your value goes up, your effective tax rate goes down to no more than population inflation. Right now with property taxes going up 8 and 9% or more in our urban and suburban areas, in 8 to 9 years, your taxes double. You can't afford to have your property taxes double on appraisal value alone. So we have to have this approach where as values go up, the effective tax rate goes down to no more than population inflation. It has nothing to do, Ross, with replacing that with sales tax. That's just called reducing taxes. But then what I talked about is not a tax swap for property tax. What I talked about is looking at, and we should study this. Let's have a serious discussion of can we raise the sales tax a penny or two to help reduce property taxes even more and fund education, all the programs that we want to do without driving people out of their homes? And folks, at the end of the day, um, this is a senator, my opponent, and I like her a lot, but she's just wrong on this issue. She would pass an income tax. She voted for a wage tax. That will never happen. I wouldn't even think of it. Never happened on my watch. Senator Vanderpute. Thank you very much. There's two people standing on this stage. And I'm the only one that doesn't want to raise your sales tax. I don't want an income tax for our people. Now, what I do think is unfair is the margins tax. I fought against that margins tax. We lost that vote by one in the Texas Senate. And I led the charge against. As small business owners, Pete and I know that the compliance cost of this is just not workable. <coughs> but when we talk about property tax, versus sales tax, the state doesn't have a property tax, Dan. It's the local, your county government, your city government, your school districts. And so you didn't seem to mind when teachers lost their jobs. In your scheme of swaps and taxes and raising sales tax, lowering the property taxes, would firefighters lose their jobs? Would police officers lose their jobs? It's the cities and counties that would be affected. Now, we can talk about fairness, and believe me, I know about fairness. As a small business owner, Pete and I struggled. We kept our doors open, but we always paid our bills and made sure that everything we did was under the law. But to burden Texas businesses and families with a sales tax increase, well, that's not being pro-business. And that's why I have the support of many Republican leaders and business folks who understand that Dan's policy of increasing sales tax would be a job killer for our great state of Texas. Senator Patrick. You can say all you want, Letitia, but the record doesn't match. In 2007, you opposed my amendment to lower appraisal caps from 10 to 5. You opposed, ho you opposed House Bill 3 that would lower property taxes on homes. Uh, you voted for an amendment in 2005 to put an almost 2% increase in wage taxes. That would be the first income tax in the history of Texas that she supported. And let's get away from this tax swap. They keep using these words. It's not a tax swap. It's reducing your property taxes so policemen and firemen and school teachers can afford to live in their home. And it's looking at a serious issue. Can we afford, would you rather pay an extra $50 a year in sales tax and save 1000 on your home property taxes? That's your time, sir. So... You continue to misrepresent that position, Letitia, and you know that. Senator Van Pute. Property owners are squawking about their property taxes, and a state district judge has once again said the state's funding for public schools is out of whack, creating a system where the quality, the quality of education in Texas depends in large measure on where you live. What's the solution to this? It comes around every 10 years or so. I've been in the legislature for 20 years, and what I know is that the number one job of the legislature is to make sure that we fund our public schools. In 2006, we responded. That's when the Texas margins tax was enacted. And that system is not fair. When school districts all across this state, both property poor, property rich, suburban school districts, inner city school districts, and our treasured rural school districts 
all sue the state, it's because of a reason. The legislature hasn't done its job. And you know what? What the judge said was correct. Now, all of us don't like to pay our property taxes, but those property taxes are at the local level. And yes, I voted to make sure that your county commissioners, your city leaders, and your elected school board trustees are the ones that set the tax rate, not bureaucrats here in Austin. Respect the local leaders and make sure that when the voters vote for them, they hold them accountable, not someone up here in Austin, Texas. As Lieutenant Governor, I would make sure that we would have a strong committee of senators and work with the House members on reforming our tax system of property, appraisals and appeals. You see, that's where the problem is, on appraisals and appeals. And Senator Patrick, I know that you don't recognize when you go over the time, but you gotta recognize when the rules are set for taking that oath of office, it's to make sure that we respect all levels of government. There's a place for state government, and that's why I'm running to be your next lieutenant governor, and there's a time to respect local leaders, and I do. The decision-making about tax rates should be left with those closest to the people. Senator Patrick. Well, exactly, and by the way, you're talking about uh, reforming the appraisal system, please. Last, se last session we had House, House Bill 585 that would reform appraisal review boards. She voted against it. We had a bill that said if you lost your home in a natural disaster, it was an amendment by Democrat Senator Eddie Lucio, that you would not be hit with the quick appraisal increase as you're rebuilding your home. She voted against it. You've heard her very clear. She doesn't care. She doesn't mind if you can't afford to stay in your home because of property taxes. It's a train wreck for you and for the state. Now, she's actually talking about my plan. She doesn't realize it. When you take that seesaw, that the effective tax rate would go down to no more than 3 or 4% as your value goes up, then you leave it to the local school board. We would have to empower them with legislation so that they can go to the people directly. The cities and the counties the same way if they need it more than 3 or 4%. Because right now, here's what Texans have, taxation through evaluation without representation. So if your taxes go up 7 or 8 or 9% a year, there's nothing you can do about it. I want to empower you, the homeowner. And by the way, I want to empower people who live in apartments because that's their home too. About a third of people in Texas live in apartments. And one of the proposals that I want to have senators take a look at and study is can we remove apartment buildings from commercial um, identification? In other words, allow apartment buildings to have the same protections for a homestead cap as a person who lives in a home. Because when you go home at the end of the day and you go to your apartment, that's where you live. And right now, you're not protected from 10, 20, or 30 percent increases to your apartment owner who has to pass it on through your rent. So I'm going to protect everyone who lives in a home, rental homes, homes, or apartments, and lower your property taxes. I will get it done. Senator Van Pugh. Thank you. The record is clear. I want to make sure that the decisions that affect the taxpayers about property tax stay with the local elected officials your county judge, your county commissioners, your city uh, council members, and your school board trustees. Certainly, we don't want to hamper their ability to have fire, police, and necessary services. And it includes our community college districts. My opponent can say all he wants, but it's about that local control, and I respect local leaders. Senator Patrick, this one's for you. If Texas moves away from standardized testing yeah. in public schools, how can taxpayers hold those schools accountable? And how will we know that the children in Tyler or El Paso or Houston are getting the same education? Great, great question. And by the way, my opponent only cares about local control sometimes. Because this year, I sponsored a Senate bill to keep Common Core, a national curriculum from Washington, out of Texas. There was only one Democrat on Education Committee who voted to keep Common Core in Texas. She wants Washington telling your local school boards what they can teach in the classrooms. So you have to be consistent, Leticia. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of this issue, um, uh, Ross, um, on testing, we spent a lot of time, and Leticia and I worked together. I mean, she's been on education with me for four sessions. May have been there before I joined education. 
and we partnered to lower standardized testing from 15 to 5. Now today she says she wants to eliminate all testing. Uh, last year she wanted to increase testing even though we got her to support our bill finally. She wanted to keep Algebra 2 in the mix as a state test. Uh, I'm starting to get to the point, Ross, where I'm losing total confidence in our state testing because we have students with A's and B's, we've heard a lot of testimony on this, that can't pass the Algebra 1 test, for example. Either they're being pushed through social promotion or these tests are clearly not matching what they're learning. Um, in terms of testing, since we have 5.1 million students on 8,500 campuses, 300,000 teachers, 1,100 school districts, obviously we have to look out for taxpayers' dollars and we have to see how all of our school districts are doing, so you need some testing. And next session, we need to take a further look of what the right answer is. But we backed way off last session under my leadership as chair of education uh, from 15 tests to five. We may want to reduce them even more. And I think we may now be coming to a point, Ross, where the SAT and the ACT uh, would be the test. And that's the only test that colleges look for anyway. They don't look at the STAR test. But your point about accountability is correct. We have to know that all of our schools are doing their job. There has to be some level of accountability uh, that does not put the teacher or the student under the gun with an unfair test. And we're still working that through. Senator Van Pugh. Thank you. I am so glad that Senator Patrick has realized what many people have said over my 20 years in the legislature, as my ability to reach across the aisle and work with everyone, because that's what Texans do. We roll up our sleeves and we answer the challenges of today. Nothing was a better example of that as when we did work together. But what I wanted was not five tests. I filed a bill that wanted three. And I have lost confidence in our state testing system. I've heard from parents, from business leaders, and from teachers. Our high stakes testing is not working. We need to remove the high stakes testing from our schools and the burden of that. You know, we heard testimony just the other day from the superintendent of Highland Park, a very high performing school district. And there is a big disconnect between our testing system and what employers need and what we know that our children are capable of. He testified that there are about 80 students who have taken the English II honors, advanced placement, and they have scored well. But they have failed the state's English II. Now that probably because our testing company that makes hundreds of millions of dollars goes on Craigslist to get examiners to read our students' essays. It's not working. I agree with the Texas Association of Business that we need an accountability system that works. So I've called for the elimination of high stakes testing for us to use the one instrument that we know works, and that's the Texas Success Initiative, that that's a diagnostic. We could have sample testing, you know, statistical, so that we can make sure that each campus and each school district is doing right by our students. But we've got to return our classrooms to our teachers. They're free to teach and our students are free to learn. Senator Patrick. Well, that's exactly what we did last session. Um, as chair of education, again, as Leticia said, working across the aisle, one bill that I, I kicked out of committee, I know was supported unanimously and most of our bills passed with 27 or 28 votes, Republicans and Democrats, because I listened I'm really concerned about the dropout rate in our inner cities, and I'm concerned, concerned about social promotion. The key to economic prosperity is educational opportunities. We have too many students who are not ready for a job or college. In fact, our college readiness now is now down to 17% of our students. And last year, one of the issues we focused on, I'm sorry, I saw the red light, Ross, I'm sorry. Right. I just saw the red light. Okay, we'll come back around. This one's for you. More than 5.5 million Texans do not have health insurance. If you could agree somehow to cover all of them, the state does not have the medical capacity for all those patients. What's your plan to increase the state's medical infrastructure and how would you pay for it? Thank you very much. As a trusted health professional for over 34 years, I've listened to my patients right across the prescription counter. Nothing is more devastating than when they come to the pharmacy and they don't have the funds to buy the medicine for their child. Texas has much to be proud of, but boasting that we are the state with one of the highest numbers of people who lack health insurance, that's not boasting, and that's not business wise. 
we know that the efforts that could have been done last session just weren't. It was political expediency. As Lieutenant Governor, I would work with the Senate, with the House, to make sure that we would bring back those hard-earned IRS tax dollars that Texas citizens are paying now and that are going for health care services in other states. We need to make sure that they come back to our state and that we have the ability for a Texas solution, one that the Texas Medical Association has called for. Part of that includes expanding those who are in this coverage gap. When Governor Perry said no to that expansion, he said no to over 200,000 jobs, to billions of dollars in health care services, and most hurtful for me, 68,000 veterans and their spouses. That would have been the only affordable and accessible health care. We know that Texans can find a solution. Part of it is making sure that in the budget that we have sound graduate medical education to make sure that those doctors that we have trained will stay here. Other conservative states with conservative governors like Jan Brewer, they make sure that they could bring those IRS dollars back here to their state. You just got to love the citizens in your state more than you dislike the federal government and make sure that in the training of healthcare professionals that we don't cut back on our universities like my opponent has voted to cut. Senator Patrick. Let's talk about health care. Texas Medical Association, all the doctors across the state have endorsed my campaign. Uh, my opponent has wanted to expand Obamacare in the state of Texas, a health care system that's crashing all over this country. Back in 2011, uh, we had a bill to create an interstate health care PAC. She voted against that. When she says some people like Washington more than others, she likes Washington more than others. Here's what we need to do in Medicare and Medicaid. All the money we send needs to come back to us in a block grant. We now have the 1115 waiver that expires September 30th of 2016, and I will urge the legislature, in fact, we'll make sure that we pass the bill so that uh, we can reapply for that. Uh, that waiver allows, in essence, a pilot program of block grants. In other words, take the money, our money that we send to Washington, and let us decide. Look, as I said to a group at the University of Texas the other day of very smart students and professors, as smart as you are, if I asked you to design a health care plan for North Carolina, you wouldn't be the ones. And the bureaucrats in Washington shouldn't be the ones designing health care here in Texas. So we'll get that done. Secondly, in terms of uh, our medical schools, we have some of the best in the country. And what, two of the things we need to do, we need to increase residency slots. We don't have enough residency slots. And where a doctor uh, does their residency, usually that's where they stay. The cost is about $60,000 per residency slot. I will dramatically increase the number of residency slots to attract more doctors. And remember early in this debate, I said that she was only one of four Democrats who voted against tort reform. That protected doctors. That's another reason the TMA did not endorse her. That's brought 30,000 new doctors here. I will bring more doctors to Texas with more residency spots and more funding for our medical schools. Senator Van Depew. Thank you. We are so proud. Our oldest daughter, Nicole, is a practicing OBGYN, and I know that she is living her life's dream because of the sound decisions that were made. I want to make sure that our state continues those sound decisions, and part of that is just one question. You can call it Obamacare, you can call it the Affordable Care Act, but what it really boils down to is do you believe that every Texas family ought to have a family doctor? And I wanted to not have that compact because that would mean insurance companies out of state would be ruling Senator. the health care and allow citizens not in this state Senator. to make those decisions. Thank you. This one's for Senator Patrick. Okay. The state's ban on same-sex marriage has been ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge. Several other states are in the same situation, and the U.S. Supreme Court has several appeals under consideration. Should same-sex unions be allowed, and is this a proper area for government regulation? Uh, our state has spoken. The people of Texas have spoken. And a judge has overturned the will of the people of Texas that says marriage should be between a man and a woman. I support the people of Texas. I support the action they took when I think it was nearly 70% of Texans voted for that. And that's been resolved in Texas. And the federal government needs to get out of our business. Senator. I think people's attitudes are changing. What was voted on back then 
I don't think would be the same results now. What we know is that our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters are in our workforce and they're in our families. They deserve full equality. As Lieutenant Governor, I would make sure that this discussion on equality would continue. And that's why I sponsored a bill last legislative session to make sure that our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters are not discriminated when they work. You see, it should be about your skill set, not about who you love. I know because it's my family. It's my family and it's Texas families. And we should support loving relationships that are committed to each other, that form the very basis of a successful Texas. Yes, federal courts all across this country have come to the conclusion that you cannot deny two people who love each other that commitment. And I hope that the decision will reach the Supreme Court and that the Supreme Court of this state will rule in favor of love and equality for all. Senator Patrick. So my opponent uh, hopes that the Supreme Court will overturn the will of about seven out of every 10 people in Texas who voted for that constitutional amendment. And standing for marriage between a man and a woman doesn't mean we want to deny any rights to, to anyone in our state. Everyone should have every opportunity and, and not be discriminated against. But this issue about marriage was something the people of Texas have spoken on. And you've heard it, my opponent uh, would overturn the will of the people if it were her call. We have reached the end of my questions and we're ready for the close. And according to the coin toss, Senator Patrick, you get to close first. Thank you, thank you. You did a great job, Ross. Great questions, substance. Um, thank you for listening and watching tonight, folks. You know, 35 years ago, Jan, my wife of 39 years, a former school teacher, uh, moved to Texas. We now have two children and three grandchildren and we're proud to call Texas home. Like all families, we've had our struggles, but God has blessed us greatly. You know, I believe that Texas is the last hope for this country. We are the model that the other 49 states should want to copy. That's why over a thousand people a day are moving here. They're coming here because our spirit is unmatched. Our economic engine is second to none. And people know they can come here and still dream. And if they work hard enough, see those dreams come true. Under Republican conservative leadership, we've led the nation in job creation the last decade. No one's even close. We're now the 12th largest economy in the world. This is now not a time to elect a liberal to be lieutenant governor who would change every policy that we put in place and turn Texas into California. As my friend Donna Campbell likes to say, there's not another Texas to move to. We have to get it right. As your Lieutenant Governor, I'll protect life, secure the border, ensure economic and educational opportunity for everyone and keep our economy strong. I ask for your vote. Thank you and God bless your family and God bless Texas. Senator Van Butte. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure to visit with the voters of Texas tonight. You know, I'm a pharmacist, a legislator, a mother, and a grandmother. But what I bring in leadership to this state is a responsible decision-making framework, not a my way or the highway mentality that happens in Washington, D.C. My opponent has already said that he's not gonna work with Democrats. Well, we know best that when we get to the Capitol, it's not about a red team or a blue team, it's about that red, white, and blue Lone Star Texas team. Sam Houston said it best when he said, do right by Texas and suffer the consequences. And I believe that because I'm more interested in sound solutions and not sound bites, responsible versus reckless. And I know that I am more interested in our children's report cards than political scorecards and the next election. I wanna be your Lieutenant Governor. And I have a plan, a prescription, that makes sure that we focus on the future of this great state, putting in investments and valuing that hard spirit in the Texas that has that grit and ganas of work and making sure that our next generation is prepared. I ask for your vote tonight. I am ready to lead. Thank you very much. Muchisimas gracias. Dios y Texas. I have a bunch of these little green cards if you all want to stay for a couple more hours. I'd like to thank both the candidates for the discussion tonight and our partners in this debate, KLRU-TV, Austin PBS, Univision Austin, the Texas Association of Broadcasters, and of course, the Texas Tribune. 
Don't forget to vote in this year's general election. October 6th is the last day you can register. Early voting runs from October 20th through October 31st. And election day is Tuesday, November 4th. Thanks and good evening.